Shalom, welcome, friends. This is Eliyahu Sheer from Chesed Ve'emet, www.lovingkindness.co. And today we're learning the Talmuds. We're studying Masechet Brachot, the Gemara dealing with blessings, a very wonderful Gemara with so much inside it, Halakha, Agada. And um, we're currently on Daf Gimel Amud Base. That's page three, and we're on the second side. We're at a point in time now where we discussed a new argument that was beginning when we left off on the previous Shi'ur. And I'm just going to read through this argument again so that we can know exactly where we are in terms of the discussion. So here's what happened. Tanu Rabbonin, the rabbis taught in a Tosefta, Arba Mishmaros Havei Halayla. The night is divided into four watches. Why is the Gemara telling us this? This is because at the beginning of the Mishnah, the Mishnah asked a question and said, From what time may we begin reciting the Kriyat Shema in the evening? And we learned, From the time that the Kwanim entered to, in, to eat their Truma. And then we said afterwards, Until the end of the first watch. And we said over there in the Mishnah that these are Divrei Rabbi Eliezer until the end of the first watch. And since the Mishnah says over there until the end of the first watch, the question has to come about, as the rabbis are teaching in the Tosefta over here, is if it was the first watch, how many watches are there? And the teaching in the Tosefta says that Arba Mishmarot Havehalayla, that there are four watches during the night. And so therefore, if we say until the end of the first watch, if there are four watches, each watch is three hours long, and therefore you have until three hours in the evening to do the Kriyat Shema. Divrei Rabbi. These are the words of Rabbi. Wherever we see the word Rabbi, we know that this means Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, who was known as Rabbi. That was his, he, everybody knew that when you said Rabbi, everybody knew you were speaking about Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, the author of the Mishnah. So the author of the Mishnah holds that there are four watches to the night. Rabbi Nassan Omer, Rabbi Nassan says, Shalosh, there are three watches. Implication, if we have until the end of the first watch, we have until four hours in the evening to say the Kriyat Shema. Says the Gemara, my time to Rabbi Nassan, what is Rabbi Nassan's reasoning? Rabbi Nassan says that there are three watches. Very good. I'm prepared to accept it. Uh, we need a reason for it though. Dixiv, here's the proof. Gemara makes a question. The Gemara gives us an answer, a proof. Where is the proof coming from? From the Tanakh itself. Vayavu Gidon umeya ish asherito. The Pasuk says that Gidon came together with a hundred people with him. Who at the end of the camp, Rosha Ashmorot Atikona. And they came at the beginning of the middle watch. Tana. So it was taught. Ein Tikona. The expression tichona, which means the middle, can only apply if there is something before it and something afterwards. Then there's a middle point. One, two, three. There's a one, there's a three, and there's a middle point, number two. Fine. According to Rabbi Nassan, it makes perfect sense to understand the verse this way. The Rabbi, that Rabbi who came along and said that there are four watches in the night, how would he possibly explain this verse? My tichona. How could he explain the concept of that these people were coming in the, at the beginning of the middle watch? If there are four watches, there's no middle. Tichoina, my tichoina, achas mina tichoina, sheba tichoinos. What he meant to say is that when we speak about the middle, we're speaking about one of the middle of the middle. Meaning you've got one, two, three, and four, and there are actually two middles, number two and number three. And so he said, Obviously, this whole episode occurred at the beginning of one of the middle points. Okay, that's his reasoning. Doesn't sound so good, but that's what he said. For Rabbi Nassan, now, how would Rabbi Nassan respond to Rabbi's reasoning? Me, kasiv. Remember, in the Gemara, the word me does not mean who, like in modern Hebrew, but rather it's a question. It's a question for a question word, which does, it indicates a question form. For example, is it, or me kasiv, but is it written, tichona shiba tichonot? Does the verse say the middle of the middle? Tichona kasiv. It says the middle. 
And therefore, Rabbi, a Rabbi who came along and said that it must be one of the middle points doesn't make sense because the verse clearly says at the beginning of the middle watch. And definitely there is no one, uh, you, can't take, uh, you can't take sides. It's the beginning of the first of the middle or it's the beginning of the second of the middle. Middle is middle. Therefore, his reasoning makes no sense. And therefore, we must hold by what Rabbi Nossin said, that there are three watches, which means when we said that you can say the Kriyat Shema until the end of the first watch, it means until the end of four hours in the evening. My time made a Rabbi. So what was Rabbi's reasoning in that he said that there are four watches? Omar Rabbi Zrika, that's a very strange thing. If his reasoning can't hold true in terms of the particular verse that we spoke about, what could his reasoning have possibly been that he said that there are four watches? Omar Rabbi Zrika, Omar Rabbi Ami, Omar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. So Rabbi Zrika said that Rabbi Ami said that Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said. There's a big tradition over here that there's a definite uh, there's a definite direction that we're going in, and it's a clear proof that somebody made the statement. In, somebody said it in so and so's name, in so and so's name. Basically, everybody heard it from the previous rabbi. Kosov Echad Omer. One verse says. The verse says, King David is talking, and he says that at midnight, I arose, or I arise, to give thanks, to give thanks to you, on your, on your, righteous, on your righteous laws, on your righteous judgments. The cause of Echad Omer, and one other verse says, Kitmu Enai Ashmurot that my eyes have preceded your watches. So in one verse, King David says that he woke up at midnight. That's the time that he woke up in order to give thanks to Hashem. And on the other hand, he says that when he woke up, that his eyes had preceded the watches, which indicates that there must be still two watches ahead of him. Otherwise, it would simply say that when he woke up at midnight, meaning at the midpoint of the evening, there would probably only be one watch in front of him but there are two which means to say that his eyes precede two watches and he's at the midnight point how could this be it must be that there are four watches in the evening and what really happened is that there were two watches that already preceded him waking up and there were two watches that followed on after he woke up and that's the point that he woke up at the middle point that's the chatzot that's what the verse means when it says that we spoke about the middle points. Two watches preceding the middle point, two watches following after the middle point. For Rabbi Nosan, well, wait a second. If Rabbi is correct in his reasoning, how would we possibly understand, how could Rabbi Nosan possibly understand how Rabbi has understood these particular verses? Savar la Rabbi Yeshua. Well, he holds just like Rabbi Yeshua. It's none. As it was taught in a Mishnah, we learned it in a Mishnah, Rabbi Yeshua Omer, Rabbi Yeshua says, Ad shalosh sha'ot, until three hours. This is what happened. Shekein, derech melachim la'amot b'shalosh sha'ot. It is the way of kings to stand after, at three hours into the day. Implication, Kings awaken three hours into the day, which is later than the average person awakens. Normal people wake at, uh, awaken at a certain time, and kings can sleep later than everybody else and wake up at a later time. Therefore, how can we understand the fact that King David said that he woke up at Chatzois at midnight, and yet there were still, still two watches ahead of him, when in fact perhaps there really was only one? The answer is that there were six hours in the evening and there were another two hours during the day, which means there are eight hours, which means we're referring to the two watches of four hours each. A watch, therefore, is four hours in length. And if the night is 12 hours, so we would say four hours, four hours and four hours, and there would still be a middle point. There would be a middle watch because the night is divided into four hour increments. And therefore, how could King David have said that he, his eyes perceived the watches when there could only be one watch left over? And the answer is that there is another watch that comes about that is relative to King David. 
Because as a king, there was more time left over. We see over here that there are in fact two extra watches. If we read the English here, that explains it very clearly. Since it is customary for kings to rise during the third hour of the day, if David rose at midnight, he would be awake for six hours of the night and two hours of the day, which amounts to two watches, because each watch is four hours long. We said that the, if the watches are three, there are three watches in the evening, and each watch is four hours. This makes sense. Therefore, King David could say that he forestalls the watches, as he rose two watches before the rest of the kings in the world. Ravashi Omar, Ravashi said, Mishmara, Upalga, Nami Mishmarot, Karuluhu. In fact, if we take a watch and we take half of a watch, which means what? If he woke up at six, at he, the, six the six hour point in the night, the halfway point, and we call a watch four hours, then we can say that what happened is that there were six hours still ahead of him, which means four hours plus two, which means a watch and a half. So therefore, a watch and a half, Mishmarot Karuluhu, can also be called watches. And therefore, the verse makes perfect sense. It's not that there are four watches in the evening in terms of the fact that there are three hours to each watch. The truth is that there are only three watches, and each watch is four hours. Then how could King David have said such a statement that his eyes precede the watches? Because we're learning out over here that perhaps he preceded one watch and a half, which is also considered watches. Or alternatively, he could be referring to the fact that the average king awakens in the third hour of the day, which means to say that there were the six hours of the evening and then another two hours making eight hours. And so therefore, King David's eyes proceeded in his waking, and when he woke up, he proceeded but two watches. For Omar Rabbi Zrika, Omar Rabbi Ami, Omar Rabbi Yeshua Belevi, a new topic. Rabbi Zrika said, that Rabbi Ami said, that Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said, Ein omrim bifneha meis, ele devarav shel meis. A very beautiful and important concept. We do not say in front of the dead, except for words that relate to the dead. And what are we speaking about over here? We speak about the concept of a person who died. A person is lying, let's say, for example, on his deathbed. He's lying, he died on the bed itself. And we now find ourselves fulfilling the mitzvah of sitting with this dead person in front of us. We must be very careful with the things that we say in the presence. We must remember that though the person has died and left this world, that the soul still has a certain measure of attachment to its body, meaning to say, not that it is connected as in the sense that it was just a few minutes before, before it left the body for good and it left to enter the next world. But what we mean to say is since the soul has not yet entered into its new palace that it is going to, it hovers around the body for a certain period of time. And because the soul is present around the body, those people that find themselves in the presence of this person should be very careful with the words that they use around the dead person. We have to show respect for the person that is passed on. And so the Gemara says that Rabbi Zrika said that Rabbi Ami said that Rabbi Yishu ben Levi said that we don't say words in the presence of the dead, except for those words that relate to the dead. What does that mean exactly? Um, there he doesn't mention over here what they are. I'm going to discuss it in a moment. He just says, as speaking of other matters, appears to be contemptuous of the deceased, underscoring that he is unable to talk while those around him can. Therefore, one must remain fully engaged in matters relating to him. These concepts come up again and again. That when we find ourselves in a cemetery, when we find ourselves around a dead person, and all these various things, we must remember that everything that we do must be consistent with the honor and respect that is due to this dead person. We must not be frivolous. We must not behave in a way that is filled with laughter and joy uh, uh, in a manner that shows some sort of contempt towards the dead person who is no longer able to partake of things in this world. And therefore, according to the opinion over here expressed in the Gemara, 
one should only say things in the presence of the dead that relate to the dead. But what could we speak about, for example, perhaps things like that relate to the funeral that's going to be? Or important things, or how do we deal with this body now? What do we do with it? Do we touch it? Do we move it? How far can we move it? What can we do with it? Which parts of the body can we touch? Can we close the eyes? Can we close the mouth? We need to know all the halachot that pertain to this particular person. Is it Shabbos? Is it a weekday? We need to know all the halachot relevant to the particular instance of the person that died. So it could be that when there are people in the room, they might begin to discuss, well, what do we do now? Do we phone the Hevra Kadisha and they will take care of the body and they will uh, bring out somebody who will then take the body to be buried and it will go through the process of tahara, of purification, and so on and so forth. What should we do? What is our duty? We speak about concepts that are related to the dead person. But we must be very careful not to speak about a joke or not to speak about the shopping that we need to do or to not to speak about all sorts of activities. And certainly we should be very careful not to speak about Torah concepts because the dead person is now in a state whereby they cannot study Torah. So we have a bit of a difficulty going on as to what we could do. Perhaps we could say to Tehillim. Well, Tehillim is prayer and that's a comfort to the soul. So that's something else. Let us take a look uh, high up over here on the notes. Before the dead, one may speak only of matters. There are many halachot regarding respect for the deceased. Most of these fall under the rubric of respect for living. Halachot, whose purpose is to respect the family of the deceased. The halachot governing conduct in the presence of the dead were not established due to the fear of the dead. Rather, they are intended to protect those no longer capable of defending themselves. One who discusses Torah in the presence of the deceased flaunts, albeit unintentionally, his superiority over the deceased, which the sages viewed as mocking the weak. This is based on the verse, one who mocks the poor blasphemes his maker. Who is the poor person, in other words? The dead person. When a person is blaspheming the poor, how does he blaspheme him? By speaking words of Torah in his presence, because since he is poor, he is unable to study Torah. It is as if he lacks something. One who disrespects the dead disrespects God and the divine image that God imparts to every person. Says the halakha, before the dead, one may speak only matters relating to the dead. In the room in which the deceased lies, one may not discuss Torah matters, even if he is more than four cubits from the body. One may speak only of matters relating to the burial and eulogy or of other matters honoring the dead. Discussing other matters is prohibited within four cubits of the body, but permitted beyond that distance. One is permitted to discuss matters concerning the deceased within four cubits of his body. That's according to the Bach. The halachic ruling is in accordance with both opinions, though most decisors rule in accordance with the first. In other words, this piece of Gomorrah that we're learning here is vital to our day-to-day -day living, that when we find ourselves in the presence of a person who has died, we must be aware that there are, uh, there are a multitude of halakhot that we need to familiarize ourselves with. And of course, the most important, as is brought down here in this short teaching over here, is that in the presence of the dead person, we may only say things that relate to the dead person. Omar Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana said Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana, Lo Amaran Ela Bedivrei Torah. Actually, they only said this with regards to words of Torah. In other words, don't speak words of Torah in the presence of the dead. But with regards to general words, words, the Alma, of a general nature, we have no problem with that. Which means to say, if you want to speak about the shopping and various other things, well, go ahead and do it. However, it's not a simple matter. And the truth of the matter is, one should be very careful and everything that is done in the presence of this dead person should be done with respect. Everything that is spoken about should be spoken about with respect. It is not a time to speak about general events that are going on. It is a time to attend. It is time to uh, it is a time to attend to the needs of the dead person who's at this point in time the mitzvah is to be buried. Uh, as soon as possible, to go through the process of Tahara, to be purified by the Hebra Kedisha, and thereafter to be buried and eulogized in accordance with the laws of the Torah. The Ika de Amre, and there are those that say, Omar Rabbi Bar, Omar Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana. This is the same person. There are those who say that Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana 
said the following. Lo amaran ela apilu bedivrei Torah. They didn't say this except with even with regards to the words of Torah. The kol shekain milita olma, and all the more so for words that pertain to a general nature, which means to say, in the presence of the dead person, we have to have such respect that it's not only, I mean, even words of Torah, which are beautiful, which are godly, that's what we're supposed to be doing all day long, studying Torah, teaching Torah, the mitzvot, etc. So therefore, if I'm in the presence of the dead person, what could possibly be wrong with studying Torah? Isn't that the greatest thing to do? Says the Gemara, that is not true. That even with regards to Torah, we do not study Torah in the presence of the dead. Certainly, if we do not study Torah in the presence of the dead, we also do not speak about matters that are just of an ordinary nature. The Gemara continues. Uh, let me just go back to the background here. This halacha was only said, lo amaran ela. This phrase, this was only said with regard to case A. But with regard to case B, this halacha does not apply, is a standard formulation that restricts the application of a halacha that was presented as a general statement. The Gemara explains that it only applies to specific cases. So this words, these words that we've learned over here, where we said, lo amaran ela, that the sages were only speaking about this particular case in the following case, is coming to teach us to the exclusion of something else, meaning these words were only said with regards to a certain particular case, but not to other cases. The Gemara continues now with our previous discussion about King David waking up in the middle of the night. And this is the way of the Gemara. Indeed, it is called the Talmud Bavli, which means the Babylonian Talmud. But the expression Bavli is also related, as we speak about when we talk about Bavel, where we speak about the Tower of Bavel. What does Bavel mean? It even comes from, the. In, you, you can use the same language in the same expression, even in English, where we say Bavel, to, to babble, to babble. What does it mean to babble? To babble means to say nonsense, to go on and on, just to talk about all sorts of things. One's mouth can just uh, utter all sorts of things going on. That's called babbling. So the Talmud Bavli is also in this concept of babble. What does it mean to babble? It means what you see is a confusion of thoughts. There's nothing wrong with that. The idea of the Talmud is to express itself through different ideas of halakha and agada. There are times that we learn law and there are times that we learn stories. And then even when we learn the stories, they're all one story that is interspersed with another story. There's no logic to it. A person who wants to learn logic can do a number of things. One, he can open up a rambam and he can learn all the halakhot as pertain to law itself from the Rambam, and he doesn't have to worry about the stories. On the other hand, if he enjoys the stories, he can learn the Ein Yaakov. He doesn't have to learn the Gemara itself. He can learn the Ein Yaakov, which are the stories that are taken from the Gemara without the halakhic points in it. Decide. A person can decide what he enjoys learning. But as he learns the Talmud, the amazing thing is that he will see on a page uh, sections that are dealing with halakha, sections that are dealing with stories, and then even with the sections that are dealing with stories, there's an interspersion. On the one hand, we've just been learning about a concept about the dead, and all of a sudden, we're learning about King, da King David first, that he woke up at midnight, and, and then he would the daven to God, and he would study Torah, and then afterwards he learned about a dead person, and be, be respectful to the dead person, and now the Gemara is coming back to the concepts of King David. This is the nature of the Talmud Bavli. It, everything is interspersed with everything else, one thing upon the other. There's no real logic to it. There's just an idea of concepts that are taking place that we need to keep on understanding. And this is the path to learn the Talmud, to get our minds to think on a deeper level. We do this by means of thinking about different concepts at different times so that we can deal with different ideas and come out with something that is meaningful. We need to learn how to think correctly. And it is, in fact, through the process of a thought which seems confusing, that through the abundance of these different thoughts, our minds start to begin to think of different ideas that helps us to think clearer. The Gemara continues. The David, the Palga de Lelia Hava Ko'ei, did King David really get up at the halfway point at the night time? Me'urta Hava Ko'ei. The Gemara tells us that he would actually awaken, in other words, he would get up, meaning to serve God, at the evening time. He didn't arise at midnight. 
he began his process of Torah study and serving God and singing praise to God already at the beginning of the night time. Dixiv, as it is written. Kidamti baneshef va'ashaveya. The verse says that I preceded the neshef. What does it mean? I preceded the nef- neshef and then I cried out. Crying out refers to that he was praying to God, singing God's pra- praises. What is this word neshef? Umimai dahai neshef otahu. The Gemara asked the question, how do you know that this word neshef refers to the evening? What does the word neshef mean anyway? Where does it come from? Dixiv, because it's written in the Pasuk, Beneshef Be'erev Yom. The Ishon Laila the Afela. In the in the in the Neshef, which is the evening of the daytime. So at that time, in the darkness of the night, uh, in the black and the darkness of the night time. We see over here from this verse that the word Neshef refers to the evening. Fine. It seems to us, therefore, that King David would begin his process of studying Torah and his singing out to Hashem and crying out and whatever it is that he did, he would begin that already at the early evening. But he didn't do it at Katsot. Omar Rav Oshaya, Omar Rabbi Acha, Rav Oshaya said that Rabbi Acha said, Hachi Ka'amar, this is what he said. In other words, this is what King David said. May Olam, Never did it happen that lo avar alai chatzot laila b'sheina. This is the interesting teaching. The teaching says that King David said that he never let it be that the midnight would pass by him with sleep. What does it mean that the midnight would... Uh, uh, I'm just going back to the notes again. What would it mean that the midnight would not pass by him with with without with his, with his sleep? It means that King David was awake at the midnight period. I'm just looking here at the notes again. When did David arise from his sleep? Matai come David Mishnato. The Jerusalem Talmud suggests an alternative resolution to the contradiction between the verses, based on Rabbi Natan's opinion. Two different cases have been discussed. When he dined at a royal meal that evening. David would rise at midnight, but when he did not, he would rise at the end of the first watch. This is what it means. So, in other words, well, King David is pointing out uh, the verse in the Gemara is teaching us that King David would not let the midnight pass by in sleep. The reason that he did so is because we have a principle that at the midnight period, there is a, there is a moment mm-hmm. at which the soul experiences a 60th of death. And this occurs at this midnight period. However, a person who does not sleep at the midnight period will not experience the 60th experience of death. And King David never wanted to experience the moment of what it could feel like at death until he died. And as a result of that, he made certain that he was always awake at Katsot time. As we see, and we discussed this Earlier on in previous shiurim, it is the custom of the tzaddikim, of the mukubalim, to awaken slightly before chatzot and to begin the day of avodah in serving Hashem already before midnight period. At midnight, as the moment strikes, at that point in time, whatever we call it, we need to discuss in more detail how this chatzot time works again. But the point is at midnight, people then say the tikkun chatzot the prayer over the destruction of the temple. And then they continue their studies, in, particularly, in particular, they're studying the Nistar parts of Torah, the hidden parts of the Torah, but they might study the revealed parts of Torah as well. But one who is gifted, one who has the ability to study the Nistar, should certainly spend that time studying the hidden parts of the Torah, the Kabbalah, because the night time is the most beautiful time to be engaged in the study of the secrets of Torah. Now, this person, of course, who then wakes up slightly before midnight and he does the Tikkun Katsot and he studies Torah, and then afterwards he goes and he davens the Nates, which means to say Vatikin. He davens the Shmona Esrei at the earliest possible time, just as the sun is rising. And after he's finished davening, he'll put on, perhaps he'll wear Rashi to fill in, and then he'll put on the Rabbeinu Tam to fill in. And then afterwards he'll study Torah for an hour or so. Then he might go home, he might have something to eat, and he might then 
have an hour or two of rest before his day begins. A completely different schedule as to what most of uh, most people will experience in that they will go to sleep late and then they will wake up just in time to begin the day for work and already the sun has risen and uh, they have to get out and they have to do their davening, get on with the day already. Now they don't have time to rest. But the Mukubalim and the Tzadikim have a different schedule in their life, which often includes that after all the davening in the morning, they might spend an hour or two resting before they again begin the avoider of the rest of the day. But the bottom line is that they don't get to a point whereby they sleep through the Chatzot time and therefore experience death. So King David didn't experience this death, and this is what he wants to tell us. That this is what it means, that the verse that says, I rose with the Neshef and cried, but I always at least fulfilled the verse at midnight. I rise to give thanks for your righteous laws. Rabbi Zaira Omar, we continue. Rabbi Zaira said, Ad Chatzos Laila, until midnight, King David used to slumber, used to doze off like a horse. What does it mean he was dozing off like a horse? It means just like the horse doesn't fall asleep completely, but rather just dozes off in order to get the rest that it needs. So too King David would kind of doze off, but he wasn't completely asleep. From this point onwards, Hayamis Kaber Kari. He would strengthen himself like a lion. Ravashi Amar, Ravashi said, Ad Chatzos Laila, until midnight, Haya Oseik Bedivrei Torah. King David would occupy himself with words of Torah. Mikan Ve'elach, from this point onwards, Veshirot Vetishbachot. He would serve God by singing and, pr and praising him with songs and praises. And this is the opinion of Rabbi Zeira that this is what King David would do during his evening service of God. Now the Gemara continues. The Neshef, regarding this Neshef that we learned about before, where we said that the Neshef refers to the evening, or the start of the evening, Urtahu, the Gemara asks the question, is the Neshef that we're speaking about the evening? Ha, Neshef, Tzafrahu. Actually, Neshef, is the morning. How do I know that? Once the Gemara puts a statement like that and says it out straight, you should know this and this is the situation. You cannot make a statement like that unless you have a verse that can back you up. So the Gemara says, don't worry about it. I have a verse that can back me up. As the verse says, And King David he struck, he smote, he, 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 he killed them, he killed people from, he slew them from the Neshef, again, no translation for the word Neshef, until the evening of the next day. My love, Mitzafra, Vad Leila. Doesn't this mean, if we say Neshef, because it says Neshef Ad Ha'erev, it must mean the morning that David was killing off his enemies from the morning until the evening. It certainly doesn't mean from the evening till the evening, because otherwise it would have said, Vayakam David meha erev erev. The fact that it says meha neshef erev comes to teach us that neshef refers to the morning. So when we say that King David was alert at the neshef time, we're referring to the morning, not the evening. Lo, the Gemara says no. Actually, what it means is from one evening until the next evening. It's just an expression. And the expression comes to teach us from the evening until the evening. And it's just simply an expression which is used as another word for evening. If so, says the Gemara. Very nice reasoning. Uh, sounds good to me. The Gemara should have written well, that's what he said before. Either say, Meha Erev, Ata Erev, or another way to say it, which would make more sense to help us understand the word Neshef, is to say, Meha Neshef, Ata Nefesh, ne Neshef, from the Neshef until the Neshef, or Meha Erev, Ata Erev, whereas we said before, from the evening till the evening. Why is the Gemara using such a strange, why is the Tanakh using such a strange expression? What's it coming to teach us? Meha Neshef, Ata Erev. Say Erev ad Erev, say Neshef ad Neshef, which, whichever one you want to do. 
Ella, Oma Rava. But Rava answered and said, I'll tell you what it's all about. Tre Nishve Havu. There are actually two periods of time which are called Neshef. There is Neshaf Lelia, the Ase Yemama. There is the Neshaf, the Neshef of the nighttime. And then the daytime comes. Neshaf Yemama, the Ase Lelia. Then there is the Neshaf, the Neshef of the daytime, which then brings on to the night. So we see that the word Neshef can mean both concepts. The Gemara continues. For David, Mi hava yada palga delayla emas. We said that David Amelech would arise at midnight in order to serve God. Very interesting. Uh, did David Amelech have a watch? Was it analog? Was it digital? How did King David know that it was the middle of the night? Most of us that wake up in the middle of the night, if we don't look at a clock, we have no idea what time it is. How are we going to know? How are we going to know to do tikkun chatzot? How are we going to know that it's the time to begin serving Hashem? It's the midnight period. How did he know? Did he know when it was the middle of the night? Wait a second. Not only that. Hashta. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu lo hava yada. Moshe himself, Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher, he did not know when midnight was. And if Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know when midnight was, how did King David know when the midnight was? How do we know that Moshe didn't know when it was midnight? Dixiv, because the verse says, halayla, betok mitrayim. At the halfway point of the night time, at midnight, I will go out amongst the Egyptians. This is referring to the fact that God was going to redeem the Jewish people on the night of Pesach. When did the last plague occur? The tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. This occurred at midnight. Now, when Moshe Rabbeinu was telling Paro, he was telling Pharaoh when the plague was going to strike, he used the expression and he said, at about midnight, I'm going to go out uh, into Egypt. It doesn't say at midnight, I'm going to do it. But rather the verse says at about midnight, I will go out into, 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 into Egypt. Very interesting. So it seems to be that Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know the exact time it was going to occur. Because had he known the exact time that it was going to occur, he would have used the expression, at midnight time, I will be going out amongst e Egypt and I'm going to smite all the firstborn. God is going to smite all the firstborn, in other words. But he didn't use that. He said, at about midnight. Perhaps it will be 11.55. Perhaps it will be 12.05. Maybe it will be 12.01. Maybe it will be 12.06. Because who knows exactly when midnight really is? Let us read the note above. Did David know when it was midnight? But David, did he know when it was the midnight? Unlike noon, which is relatively easy to determine, the precise moment of midnight is difficult to ascertain. One would require precise clocks, and even then, it would be difficult to be certain when it was midnight. On the other hand, one can rely on even the most primitive timepiece to approximate the time of midnight. Therefore, the Gemara, the Gemara questions how David knew the precise moment of midnight. My kachatzos, the Gemara continues, what does it mean when it says at about midnight? Ilema, if you want, you could say, this is what the word means. Ilema, if you want, say, I'll tell you, you could possibly think it means this, or perhaps it means something else. If you want, say, to Omar Lei that maybe what it is, is that Hakodesh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be He, He said, Kachatsois, at about midnight. Mi ikasveika kamesh maya, is there a doubt? When we speak towards heaven, in other words, if God was telling Moshe Rabbeinu 
that it's going to be at midnight, that God is going to go through all of Egypt and destroy the firstborn. So when God gave the command that Moshe should tell them about it, he shouldn't have said to Moshe, tell them at about midnight, I will kill the firstborn. Tell them, he should have said to Moshe, that at midnight exactly, I'm going to kill all the firstborn. Why did Hashem use the expression, kachatzot? Why would he say such a thing? Ela de Omar lay, but he said to him, Bachatzot. The truth of the matter is that when God told Moshe that he was going to come through Egypt and destroy all the firstborn at midnight, he actually told him, Bachatzot, at midnight time I'm going to do it. The Asa Ihu Amar. And he, Ihu, he, Moshe, Ata, he came, Omar. And he said, Kachatzot, at about midnight. We see from here that Moshe Rabbeinu was the one that changed the language. God said to Moshe to tell the Egyptians that at, at midnight he would come through and he would destroy all the firstborn. When Moshe gave the instruction over to Pharaoh, he said to him, Kachatzot, he changed God's wording. Alma, we see, misap kale that he was in doubt, seems to be that Moshe himself wasn't quite sure when it was going to happen. And so he said, Kachatzot. For David, Havayada, how could it then be that David knew? If Moshe himself was a bit afraid and he didn't really want to say, because he didn't know exactly when it's going to be, how could King David have known? Was he any better? Did he have a better time piece on him? A better watch to be able to tell the time? Answers the Gemara. David, Simana Havale. David had a sign. To Omar Rav Acha Bar Bizna, Omar Rabbi Shimon Hasida, that Rav Acha, the son of Bizna, said that Rabbi Shimon Hasida said the following. This is what happened. Kinor haya taloi lemala mimitato David. There was a harp or a violin. We translate it uh, colloquially as saying that it was a, a harp, whereas the modern translation of the word kinor means violin. Whatever it is, he had a string instrument that was hanging uh, above his bed, uh, of Shel David, of David's bed. And here's what would happen. The moment midnight would come about, a northerly wind would come along and blow into the harp. And the harp would begin to play of its own accord. Immediately, King David would get up and he would study Torah. Until the pillar of dawn arose. Those who've been following the Shiurim are aware of the different times of the early morning. The Neitzah which we spoke about as being the sunrise when the sun can be seen. Amud HaShachar, the pillar of dawn, is that latest moment when we can recite the Kriyat Shema for the evening. That's how we discussed it at the beginning of the Gemara. And so here it was that King David was studying Torah until the pillar of dawn when the first ray of the light was breaking through the darkness. Since the Amud HaShachar, the pillar of dawn came up, here is the story. The sages of the Jewish people would come in, its law, to him, to King David. Amru law. And they said to him the following, Adonai nu hamelech, our master, the king, Amcha Yisrael trichim parnasa, your nation, Israel, require parnasa. The Jewish people require sustenance. They need to be able to eat. They need parnasa, food, money. What are we to do? How do we get money to the Jewish people? How do we get food to the Jewish people? Omar Lahim, King David answered them, which means to say what this is teaching us, is King David's evening was devoted to Torah, to Shirot for Tishbachot, to the study of Torah, to the singing and the praising of Hashem. 
He was meditating the whole night through. But once the pillar of dawn came about, his duties as the king began. And it would begin immediately when the leaders of the Jewish people would come in and they would say, our master, O king, please tell us how do we conduct ourselves now in order to acquire panasa for the Jewish people. And King David replied to them, O Malahim, lechub his panasu ze mize. He said, go out and each of you give panasa from the one to the other, which means to say, if fellow A has $100 and fellow B only has $2, let the fellow with $100 give some of his cash to the fellow with $2. And then the fellow with $100 might have $90 and the fellow with $2 will have $12. Now, what you need to start doing, said King David, is you need to start moving the cash around, cash flow, that the one who's got a little bit more gives to the one who has a little bit less and let the money move around a bit. Amrullah, so the sages said to him, that's crazy. What a crazy idea. Ain ha komets must be a isari. He said, they would say, they said to him that a, a, single, a single handful of food will not satisfy the lion. What does that mean, a, this single uh, handful of food will not satisfy the lion? We'll see more of it in a moment. Obviously, it means to say it's not going to help much to give a small portion that already exists with a small portion. The small portion is not going to take care of the lion, the Jewish nation. Meaning to say, there's not enough money amongst the Jewish people to support each other. And a pit cannot fill itself up from its own sand. Which means to say, that, uh, uh, as it says over in the translation, it can be translated really in two ways. Here he translated that, uh, that the pit will not be filled merely from the rain that falls directly into its mouth. Or you could say also that if you were to take out the, the sand of a pit and you were to put the sand back in again, you'll probably find that you won't get all the sand back in again in the same measurement as it was before. Or as it says over here, that you cannot full merely from the rain that falls directly into its mouth there just isn't enough oh my lahem so he said to them so he told them go and spread out your hands in war spread out your hands with troops which means to say go out to battle and you'll win the battle you're going to beat a group of people who are in the way you're going to kill them, and as a result of that, there will be the leftovers, all the loot, all the, all the, everything that's left over from them, you'll be able to take it and use it to feed the Jewish people. Let's go back to the notes. The sages of Israel entered. The story does not describe David's day-to-day -day affairs, but the events of a particular day in his life. But once again, what we said earlier, his day would probably begin at Amud HaShachar with all sorts of things to attend to. On this particular occasion, this is the story that took place. The, the sages came to him and they said to him, the Jewish people, I need a panasa. This was the particular instance of that day. What should we do? The notes continue. Ha-komets v'hari. The word we have translated as handful, komets, can be explained in different ways. Some hold that it refers to a pit, gomets, rendering the passage, the pit, where the lion is located, cannot satisfy him, and the lion must leave in order to find food. Others explain that it means grasshopper in Aramaic, rendering the passage, the grasshopper cannot satisfy the lion. But it means to say the Jewish people are the lion, they need to be fed, and there's not enough for them where they are. How are we going to feed them? King David says feed them by means of each one giving to the other. The sages reply, that's not good enough. If they start giving to each other, how can you use the same amount of money that's within the whole group to satisfy the whole group? They're all struggling, which means we need a source of income from somewhere else. This is simply modern economics. We can take a case of a country that has a certain amount of money in it, and the country is not doing so great. What's the only way to get the country back up on its feet again? 
We need money from another source. Another country has to put money into this country so that it will have the means to take care of itself. But with the current situation as it is in that particular country, there's just not enough money for them. The only way to attend to it is to acquire money from another source. Background. The kinor, translated here as the liar, L-Y-R-E. This refers to a member of the liar family. Strings are stretched across a special hollow box, and when the instrument faces the proper direction, the strings produce music proportional to the force of the wind. If there is a fixed wind pattern, one could have the lyre play at a specific time and serve as a type of alarm clock. And that's exactly what they would do in those days to have some sort of alarm clock to awaken them. Now, here we speak about this concept of habor v'chuliator, the pit and its mouth. In places where pits are used to collect rainwater, the rain that falls directly into the pit is insufficient because the stone structure surrounding the opening of the pit is small. Therefore, Canals and pipelines are built to channel the water from a much larger area into the pit. So it means to say the pit requires a certain amount of water, but the rain that goes into the pit is never going to fill it up. So we need other channels to move across so that ultimately the water is going to go into the pit and fill it up. And here you see one of the beautiful things about learning from this Talmud that we're learning from the Koren Talmud Bavli, that we're learning from that you see in front of you here with the translation and everything, that in addition to this translation and all the notes, there are some beautiful pictures to help us understand the concepts that are going on in our discussion. This is a stone structure surrounding the opening of a pit from the Talmudic era. And here we see over here in the second picture, an ancient water canal that allows water to flow into a pit from Tel Arad. So this is what, what was happening. We need the pipeline so that the water is going to flow through and ultimately go through and fill up the pit. Miyad, immediately. Yo'atzim ba'achitofel, they went out to ask for advice from Achitofel. Achitofel was a very wise man. And whenever it came to the Jewish people who were in need of advice, they used to go to Achitofel, who was an exceptionally wise man. So they went to Achitofel. Venim lachim the Sanhedrin. After they went to Achitofel, they would then consult with the Sanhedrin, which means to say Achitofel would give advice in terms of what to do. They would then go to the Sanhedrin to ask the Sanhedrin for permission to do what was ever necessary to do, that they weren't going against the wishes of the Torah, the wishes of God, to attack a certain people or whatever was they had to do in order to acquire their panasa. And after that, they would go and ask the Urim V'tumim. Now, the Urim V'tumim was basically the breastplate that rested on the chest of the Kohen Gadol, of the high priest. And within, the, within this breastplate, with inside it, there was the name of God that was written on a piece of parchment, whatever it was that it was written on, and it was placed inside the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol. And on the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol were 12 stones. And the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of the Jewish people would give the answer as to any question that would come up. So what they would do when they were in a situation where they needed advice, they would first go to ask Achitofel, and Achitofel would say, look, I think what we need to do over here is we need to invade a certain people, a certain nation, so that we can be successful and acquire Panasa for ourselves. And after that, they would go to the Sanhedrin, the group of sages responsible for directing the Jewish people in terms of Torah and Halakha, and they would say to them, you know, is this acceptable? Are we allowed to do it? And so on and so forth. And then uh, the Sanhedrin would give approval. And after that, they would then go and ask the Urim V'tumim whether or not they should go to war and whether or not they would be successful, as he brings down here in the notes. This was the process that they would take before invading. Omar Rav Yosef. Rav Yosef said, Micra, what verse is this whole story based upon? Micra. When we speak about this whole story taking place, that they would go to Achitofel and then they would go to Sanhedrin and then they'd ask the Uriva Tumim and the whole story that would take place. Where do you see this? You can't just make things up in your head. We need proof. Tixiv. Because the proof, the proof is that the verse says, the after Achitofel, after Achitofel, Ben Yahu Ben Yoyada, it was Ben Yahu Ben Yoyada, the Eviasar, and then we had Eviasar, 
the Sar Tzava, the Melech Yoav. And he was the minister of the army to the, uh, to the king's army and then the general, sorry, and then the Sar Tzava al Melech Yoav. And afterwards was the minister of the army of the king, Yoav. What does all of this mean? It sounds like a crazy verse. How am I supposed to understand the words of this verse? None of it seems to make sense. Achitofel. What does it mean, Achitofel? Zeo Eitz. That's the advisor. So they went to the advisor to ask him for his advice. Omer, and so it says, Va'atzas Achitofel, Asheya atz mahem. And the advice of Achitofel that he advised during those days, Kashe Yishal Ish Bidvare Elohim, that a person would ask from the word of God. So we see over here, so was the counsel of Achitofel, both with David and with Avshalom, King David's son. Achitofel was the first link in the process of the war that was to be waged. Ben Yahu Ben Yohayada, we continue now on Daf Dalit Amud Aleph, page four on the first side. Ben Yahu Ben Yohayada, the next expression of the verse, Ze Sanhedrin. When you see the word Ben Yahu Ben Yohayada, it doesn't refer to the individual person whose name was Ben Yahu Ben Yohayada, a great warrior in the army of King David, but it refers to the Sanhedrin, the Eviasar. And Eviasar, again, does not refer to Eviasar as a person. Elu Urim Batumim. This refers to the Urim Batumim. As Eviatar bin Achimel Achimelech, the priest, would oversee inquiries directed to the Urim Batumim. So Ben Yehoah ben Yehoyada was the Sanhedrin because he was the head of the Sanhedrin. So it means that they went to the Sanhedrin. And Eviatar doesn't mean that they went specifically to Eviatar. It means to the Kohen Gadol, to the Urim Batumim, to Eviatar because Eviatar was the Kohen Gadol, who would oversee the inquiries directed to the Urim Vitumim. The Chaynu Omer, and so it says in the Pasuk, Uven Yahu ben Yehoyada ala Kresi v'ala Plesi. Ben Yahu ben Yehoyada was over the Kresi and the Plesi. We have to see you. What does it mean? He was over the Kresi and the Plesi. What, is, what does that mean? V'lam nikrashmam Kresi or Plesi. Why were they called the Kresi or Plesi? Kresi. They were called the Kresi. Shekorsim divrehim, because they would be decisive in the words that they would say. Korate, they would be very particular. Placey, what does it mean? Placey, shemuflaim bidivrehim. Placey is pele muflaim bidivrehim, because their words were wondrous. Vacharkach, and afterwards, sar tzava lemelech yoav. There was the general. Of the army of, of the king who was Yoav, which means to say Yoav was the final person in the story of the war that they were going out to wage. We just read this note over here. And Ben Yahu Ben Yohada was over the crazy and placey. The verse does not exist as quoted. In Chronicles it says, And after Achitofel was Yehoyada son of Ben Yahu. However, it seems likely that if Ben Yahu Ben Yohada was the head of the Sanhedrin, as indicated in the verse in Shmuel, his son Yehoyada bin ben Yahu was also the head of the Sanhedrin. From the verse in Chronicles, and after Achitofel was Yehoyada, son of ben Yahu, the procedure is evident. They first consulted Achitofel, and then they consulted the Sanhedrin. And that was the process that they went through. So basically what we've learned about is a, a, a story that took place. King David would wake up at midnight, and he would attend to all of his prayers and his Sing, he's singing his, his praises and his songs to Hashem. And this would take place all the way until Amud HaShachar. Amud HaShachar, the day would begin already. And on this particular day that we're reading about now, the sages came to him and said, we have a problem, O king. The problem is that we, the Jewish people, need Panasa. What are we to do? And the king explained that this is the path to take. Everybody should support everybody, which was a very nice answer, very fair, but not good enough if there isn't enough money to take care of everybody. So therefore, the only alternative would be to go to war, to destroy another nation which had money and take over the booty, take over all the loot, everything that was there, take it over for themselves so that they'd be able to live themselves. They themselves were suffering. They needed a way to be able to live. Nobody else was helping them. And so they had to go to war. But before they went to war, they took a process upon themselves. They would consult, as we see over here, Achitofel. They would go first to Achitofel, who was the advisor. And then afterwards, they would go to the Sanhedrin. 
And then afterwards, they would ask the Urim for Tumim. There was a whole process, and all of this was in a godly manner to make certain that they weren't doing something that was against what the Torah stood for. They were doing things that that, that it is what the Torah did stand for and was prepared to allow so that the Jewish people could continue. Background, just one more thing here. From what from what verse is it derived? My Kura, as we said, where do we know this from? Literally, this means what is the verse? What is the biblical basis for this rabbinic statement? Most of the time, the term is employed to connote a biblical allusion to something that seems to be of a rabbinic origin. And that's what this expression means. It's an expression that comes up many times in the Gemara. My Kura, whenever we are in doubt about something, we see something saying a certain effect, whatever it is. And then they say, well, how do you know that? My Kura, you must give a proof for whatever it is that you're about to say or that you are actually saying. So we've reached the end of our shield for today. Gemara Brachot, learning from the beautiful Korin Talmud Bavli, as you can see. I hope you've enjoyed the Shi'or. If you have enjoyed the Shi'or, please do like the video and uh, subscribe to my channel. Click on the bell so that you'll be reminded of future Shi'orim that will come about. Offer a positive comment if you feel that you have learned and gained from this because it helps me to know that you're enjoying the Shi'orim and it gives me the encouragement to want to do more and provide more of these type of Shi'orim. In the meantime, I hope that you will join me for another Shi'ur. And if you want to be in touch with me, please feel free to contact me, Eliyahu Share, from my website, www.lovingkindness.co. And I look forward to being in touch with you. And I look forward to another Shi'ur. Wishing you all the best. Bye-bye. Shalom, shalom.